Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this week, we will be reading three different excerpts from the book of Job, and that will finish up our reading of parts of the Old Testament, and then you'll write your first essay. I will be making a video just focusing on the first essay, uh, talking about, you know, how I think you might want to go about it, the sort of parameters, as they say, of the essay. So that, that'll come probably in about a week when you begin to focus on it. But let's, let's talk about the book of Job, very, very famous book of the Bible. Um, you know, we've, we've looked at, at, you know, very small part of the Old Testament, obviously, but we've looked at Genesis and Exodus, which are the, the first two books of the Old Testament, first two books of the Bible, and are kind of a storytelling about the, you know, the, the, the sort of history of mankind, the history of human beings. And, um, history of the, the, the of the Israelites. We got the sort of very first part of it. Um, Job comes from a different part of the Bible, uh, along with books like Ecclesiastes and um, Wisdom and Proverbs, uh, the so-called wisdom books of the Bible, the more philosophical ones, really. Uh, Job, I, I think, is not even at all meant to be a real person. I mean, who knows these ancient sources? I mean, um, I'm not a scholar of, uh, of ancient biblical texts, but the thing reads in such a way that it's not so much the historical events that occur in Job that are meant to be taken literally. It's the philosophical message and the philosophical discussion that goes on uh, about a, uh, as you'll see, a certain problem. So these books of the Bible, uh, Job probably being the most prominent and famous one, are really uh, very philosophical in nature, the, the, the wisdom books. Um, and this book, as you'll see, explores a certain philosophical problem. Uh, there's three different readings. Uh, there's the introduction, uh, chapters one and two, which are really amazing. And I just wanted to emphasize that when I give you these uh, as uh, links to internet texts, uh, the reading is chapters one and two. So you have to read this one and, and then go to chapter two. Right? All right. So we know that. Okay. So the, the other ones too, which are longer readings, you just, just page through. So the reading is not just the chapter of Job that comes up uh, when you open up the link. You have to go to chapter two. And you, you'll want to because it really finishes up the story. And chapters one and two are like a self-contained story. And that's what's so interesting. It, it, if you look at the way that it's told and, and the, the type of language with, with phrases repeated and the very sort of, I would say, simple morality tale about a, a, a good person to whom all these terrible things happen and he's tested and, you know, the, devil and God are sort of having this competition to see if he'll break and, and curse God. And it, it does have the, the look of a folktale, I mean, of, of a kind of a, a folktale with a moral, you know, uh, and it, just read it. You'll, you'll, it's fantastic. And you, you'll see what I mean by a moral. I mean, and, and it's a very self-contained little story and it's a, it's a great little story and it's a kind of a, an essential part of the biblical literature. Um, but then, you know, what's really, really, I find really, really interesting about Job is that although chapters one and two kind of st stand on their own and, and could have been at one time, perhaps, a self-contained morality tale that was passed along pe peoples of the East, uh, not just the, uh, the Hebrews, but there's some evidence that the tale of Job uh, I've, I've read might come originally from a different culture of, of, of the Near East. Um, but then uh, what's really amazing about Job is that, is that if you go to chapter three, um, a whole different book in a way begins. That is all these terrible things happen to Job. And the moral of the tale at, at the end, by the end of chapter two is that Job just took it, you know, because he had faith in God and he was not going to complain and he was not going to um, 
you know, one time at one point his, his wife says, curse God and die. I mean, just end this thing, man. And he refuses to do it. And it, it's a very sort of neat little story. I mean, neat, all the loose ends are tied up at the end or there's no loose ends. And, but then this other thing happens in the book of Job. And uh, just to get, get a taste of it, immediately after that neat little story, chapter three, after this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, let the day perish when in I, wherein I was born and the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. And Job basically not only wishes he were dead, he wishes he, were, he had never been born. And it gets worse or it gets more sort of, um, I don't know, harsh or deep or despairing where Job really has some questions for God. You know, all these terrible things have happened to him. He can't think of what he might have done to deserve them. And he's got his friends there who are sort of telling him, you know, you, you must have done something because God wouldn't do this for nothing. God is just. And Job's response is, oh, really, is he? You know, I mean, and uh, really quite kind of uh, extreme view or extreme questioning of God goes on. Basically, not only why did you do this to me, but why are all people who are, why is it that some people who have, at least who have done nothing to deserve it, seem to have such terrible fates and, and terrible suffering, suffering inflicted on them? It's really a kind of a fantastic uh, philosophical and uh, religious objection to the human condition. And so then, uh, and this is just a taste of it, chapters three through 10, it goes, it goes on and on, you know, this really a kind of a debate between Job and his friends where his friends who have come there to comfort him, you know, in his suffering, basically say, you know, you, you, you must have done something to deserve this. And Job says, no, I haven't. And I would like God to explain why you know, he's done this to me. Uh, so we get a taste of that. And then the last reading, Friday's reading, is another incredible reading. I mean, these are all incredible readings, all great readings. Uh, chapters 38 through 42, again, you have when you open it up, please don't just read chapter 38, because that's what's going to open up um, when you click on the link, if I can ever get through to it. I'm sorry. Back. Is this link broken or what? No, oh, here we are. Yeah, it'll open up to chapter 38, but you really, this is just taken to the end of the book of Job, chapter 42. And this is where God answers Job in this amazing way. I won't, I won't say anything more about it, um, but God actually answers Job. Job has been questioning God, asking him, uh, not just why did this happen to me, but basically questioning God's, God's justice and uh, God, the Lord, God, does answer Job. He appears out of the whirlwind and, and gives a kind of response to Job, to his questioning. And, and I think that the, the really interesting question, once you've read it and you sort of see the nature of God's response to Job, is to ask yourself, well, is it really an adequate response? What kind of response is it? Does he actually give a kind of an account or any kind of response to Job's questioning, which is at all satisfactory. I think that every reader of Job, every, every person who encounters this story and goes beyond you know, the obvious sort of folktale part of it in chapters one and two and goes on to the deeper philosophical uh, inquiry into the, the, the question that is raised, everybody has to answer for themselves whether they think that, that whether they think God's response to Job at the end is really sufficient.